Hey super scientists, this is Miss Owens. We're looking in your Intro to Chemistry Lab Notebook on page 6. We're reviewing today the Chem 3 Measuring Matter Notes and learning how we can classify substances based on the types of properties that they have. So looking at any form of matter, we're going to learn how we can determine the physical or chemical properties that are exhibited by those different forms of matter. So the first type of property is physical properties. Physical properties are properties that can be determined without changing the identity of the substance. So for example, the substance is going to stay the same. It is like if you have water and you freeze liquid water, it turns into ice. It turns into solid water, but it's still water, like the icicles here on the tree during the winter time. So you have water, which we are familiar with, H2O. Generally, we think of water in the liquid form, but when you freeze water, it turns into a solid. It's still water, it's just a different state of matter. So that is an example of physical properties, something that the substance can do by itself. It's something that you can observe a lot of times just by using your senses. The second type of property is chemical properties. Now I like to refer to chemical properties as it takes two to tango. Something has to be done to that substance in order for you to know that it has that chemical property. So chemical properties describe the way that a substance can change into something else. So let's look at a couple of the physical properties up here in this picture. So if you see the little iguana here, this guy is green in color in this picture. So color is a physical property. You can see that just by looking at that organism. A slinky, if you've ever played with a slinky before, a lot of times they're made out of metal and the one in the picture here is made out of metal. So it's kind of silver in color and it's also malleable. It's in that kind of spiral shape. So those are both physical. Chemical properties, however, something has to be done to the substance for you to know it has that chemical property. So when you have bread, if you have ever um, had like a parent or grandparent make homemade bread or like sourdough bread before, you have to mix up the ingredients and let it rise and it's really like a gooey kind of thick batter. And then you have to bake it in order for it to turn into bread. So you don't know that it can do that. You don't know that it can turn into bread until it has baked, until it's had that heat applied to it. Another example is this car here. So with this truck, it's sort of a blue colored paint, but this metal has rusted. So that rust is a new substance forming. It's something that's forming in addition to what it originally was. So it's no longer that original iron-based metal, but it's got that rust formed on top from the interaction of the iron and water and oxygen in the air. So here's some chemical and physical properties. Now this is not an exhaustive list. This is just kind of hitting the highlights of things that you may be familiar with. So here are some chemical properties. Oxidation is also called rusting. Oxy, your stem, refers to the presence of oxygen. So having that interaction between iron and oxygen a lot of times will allow metals to rust. So on this car here, you've got some rust that has formed. Uh, my grandfather had a wood shop and he had his tools that he left outside all the time and so all that equipment ended up rusted because it was exposed to water and oxygen outside. Flammability, so there are certain elements, the alkali metals in group one on the periodic table, when those pure substances are placed on water, they actually catch on fire. That's an example of something being flammable and that's what you see in the beaker here. Reactivity, if you've ever used a glow stick or like a little glow necklace or something like that, you have to physically crack the glow stick in order for the liquids inside to mix. And you can hear a little glass breaking as a little capsule inside the glow stick and that allows for the two liquids to mix. And then you see it luminesce, you see light being released. So you wouldn't know that it was reactive, those two substances were reactive, unless you actually mixed them. And then pH. So here's an example of the pH scale. And lots of different substances will fall in different places on the pH scale. Water is seven, it's neutral. And if you've ever eaten something that um, is a food that's acidic, like a lemon, it's going to taste really sour if it has any acidity to it. So that's just an example, something that you may be familiar with. Now physical properties, again, are the things that you can look at the substance and know that it has that particular property. So this piece of sulfur is yellow, so that color is a physical property. Sulfur also smells really bad. It smells like rotten eggs, so that 
um, that original odor, the original smell that it has is a physical property too. Malleable, like the slinky we were just looking at, that metal being kind of spiral shaped, that is physical property. If you've ever made hot chocolate or if you've been helping to like fix dinner and made spaghetti or something and you leave a metal spoon in a pot of boiling water or in your cup of really hot hot chocolate and then you go to pick up that spoon a few minutes later that spoon is going to feel really hot if it's metal and that's because metal is a heat conductor it's thermal conductivity is the property the physical property that's referring to state of matter and changing states of matter that is physical property so if you have an ice cube ice is solid water it's frozen water when that warms up and it melts it is still water it turns into liquid water though it's just changing state so that change of state is physical property it's very important to remember that so when you're looking at physical and chemical properties, substances are going to have their original physical properties, but when they are mixed and react with other substances, those properties may change. So for oxygen, for example, we know that we can't see oxygen. It's colorless, but it's there because we breathe it in. We are, we're alive. We know that we're constantly taking in that oxygen. And mercury is a silvery, it's a light silvery kind of metal. It's the only liquid metal. So those substances have their individual properties, but when they are mixed together and they react um, with this heat applied from a Bunsen burner, it turns this kind of nasty like orangey brown color. It's a thicker sort of substance. So when they react, and it has something done to it, it exhibits a different chemical property. We know that it's reacted because of the color change that has occurred. So let's look at chemical formulas. We know that chemical formulas are going to be abbreviations for different types of chemicals. So a chemical formula is gonna tell you the elements in a substance, and it's also gonna tell you the amount of elements in each substance. We have a couple different examples to look at. So chemical formulas are gonna show you the elements that are in the compound and the ratio of their atoms. C12H22O11 is the chemical formula for table sugar. So when we look at this, we can see that there are three elements in this chemical formula. We have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Those are the three elements in this chemical formula. Now we also have some numbers here. We have subscripts. Subscripts, your stem sub means under. So subscripts are the small numbers that go with the elements. It tells you how many elements are present. So since this 12 is right here beside the carbon, beside the C, we know that that 12 goes with the carbon. So that means that there are 12 atoms of carbon. This 22 is right past the H. So that means there's 22 hydrogens. And there's 11 right here past the O for oxygen. So that means there's 11 oxygens. Now, if we didn't have a number there, like let's say that this 11 wasn't here, if it was just O and then no other number, if there's no number there past it, if there's no subscript, that indicates that there's just one of those present. It's just like in math, if you have an X, then it's understood that there's just one X because there's not another number with it. So let's look at the examples that we have in your notes. So we have C6H12O6, that is one molecule of glucose. And we're gonna count the atoms for these so you can have a little bit of practice. What I always like to do is write out the elements that we have in the chemical formula, and then I can determine the number of atoms for each of those. So we have C for carbon, H for hydrogen, O for oxygen. In this example for glucose, we have six carbon, we have 12 hydrogen, and we have six oxygen. So that's just counting up that one molecule of glucose. The other example that we have is also glucose, but it's two molecules. So whenever you have a coefficient, you have a big number in the front, that is indicating that this coefficient means we have a certain amount of molecules. So anytime you have a big number in the front, that means you have that amount of molecules. We have two molecules of glucose in this example. So instead of there being six atoms of carbon, now it's double this entire chemical formula. So we have two times six, which is 12. So we have 12 carbons. We have two times 12, so that's 24 hydrogen, and 2 times 6, 12 oxygen. 
So it's literally saying you don't just have one C6H1206, you've got two of them. So you, that's why you have to double everything for this example since you have two molecules. The next thing we're looking at is the types of mixture. So there's two categories of mixtures. On your note sheet, I'd like for you to write in this statement because that's something we're going to talk about all year. We're going to keep coming back to this information. Mixtures are not pure substances. Mixtures are not pure substances. They're not elements and they're not compounds. Uh, mixtures also have materials that are only physically combined. They're literally just kind of mixed up. They're not physically connected or reacted into something different. So that's important to keep in mind when we're looking at these mixtures. The categories of mixtures are heterogeneous and homogeneous. Now use your stems to help you remember these. Your stem hetero means different. So when you are looking at a heterogeneous mixture, you can see the different parts. You can even separate the different parts. Pizza is an example of a heterogeneous mixture. My mom loves Supreme Pizza, but I can kind of tolerate, I can deal with the Supreme Pizza, but I don't like the olives. I hate the olives. So what do I do? I pick off the olives because it's a heterogeneous mixture. If you get a pepperoni pizza, but you just like the cheese, what can you do? You can pick off the pepperonis because it's a heterogeneous mixture. You can see the different parts. You can separate the parts. You can literally pick out the pieces. Just like in trail mix, if you've ever made trail mix before, you might have Chex Mix and pretzels and peanuts and M&Ms and marshmallows, all kinds of stuff in a bowl mixed up. It's literally just stirred up. So it's just physically combined. It's not like reacted to create something new. It's just in the same bowl. So if you don't want the pretzels, pick out the pretzels. Soil is also an example of a heterogeneous mixture. Homogeneous mixture. This has your stem homo. Homo means same. Homogeneous is sometimes pronounced homogenous. So if you hear that word, it's referring to the same thing, like homogenized milk, for example. Homogeneous mixtures are substances that are evenly mixed and you can't see the different parts. It's uniform throughout the whole substance and you generally cannot separate these. For example, grape juice, it's a homogeneous mixture. Pudding is another example. Cake batter, if you're going to make a cake, then usually you've got flour and you've got sugar and oil and eggs and vanilla flavoring and things like that. You mix it all up. You wouldn't want to have a cake that when you bite into it, a chunk of it tastes like eggs or a chunk of it tastes like flour. You want it uniform. You want it all mixed up evenly. So that would be an example of homogeneous mixture. On page six, you also have kind of in the middle of your sheet, this classifying mixtures uh, sorting activity. So we're going to look at a couple different types of mixtures and you guys can record whether you think it is homogeneous or heterogeneous. So here's your different examples. Snickers. So if you look at this Snickers bar on the inside, we've got some kind of chewy nougat and we've got peanuts and caramel. We've got chocolate, all kinds of different things in there mixed together. It's just physically combined. That would be heterogeneous mixture because of all the different things that are that's in it. If you wanted to pick out the peanuts, you could. It'd take you a while, but you could. If you didn't want the chocolate on the outside, you could cut it off or you could break it off. It'd take a while. It'd be messy, but you could do it salad. So you may not like tomatoes. You may not like purple cabbage. You may not like cheese. You can pick those things off. You can literally separate those things physically, pulling them out of that substance. So salad would be heterogeneous. Rocky Road ice cream. So we specifically have this example because you can see the different parts in it. You've got marshmallows. You've probably got like some peanuts or all kinds of different things, chocolate chips maybe in this particular ice cream. So in this Rocky Road ice cream, you can see the different parts. And if you didn't want the marshmallows, which I don't know why you wouldn't want the marshmallows, but if you didn't, you could take those out. Cake batter, we were just talking about this example. You can't see the eggs in here. You can't see the oil floating around. You can't see the vanilla flavoring because it's uniformly mixed throughout. It's homogeneous, homogeneous mixture. And sugar, white crystals. It does have the word sugar written here in the crystals, but this is sugar. So it's homogeneous because it looks the same throughout. This is what your chart should look like if you've been completing it as we've looked at those pictures. So heterogeneous, Snickers, salad, Rocky Road ice cream, and homogeneous, sugar, and cake batter. Those are your two examples. 
So the last thing that we're going to do on 